Well, it's high time I rolled out another YouTube video. I wonder what I should talk about. There's so many things I could... The Peanuts movies? I've already done three videos on Peanuts. Don't you think I should move on to something else? That's true. People have been suggesting it for a while, and it got the most votes in my poll on what video I should make next. I guess I owe it to my viewers to make their wishes come true. Or maybe I'm just easily persuaded by voices like that. Okay now, I've shown you the antics of Charlie Brown and friends on the small screen. The good, the bad, and the middling. But there is a part of the Peanuts filmography that I've not yet examined. The Peanuts cast on the big screen. So far, there have been five theatrical Peanuts films released between 1969 and 2015. As with the specials, they are all of varying quality. What I'm going to do is look at each one of them by order of release and rank them as I go along. Here we go! Let's get ourselves started with A Boy Named Charlie Brown. Oh, good day for Charlie Brown! Whoa, not that! We're talking about theatrical films here, not on-air documentaries. There we go. This movie tells us the quintessential tale of Charlie Brown. If you are unfamiliar with Peanuts and wanted a feature film to give you the essence of both the comic strip and the specials up to this point, I'd say you won't find a better introduction than this movie. This film takes us through the ordeals Charlie Brown faces in his life. His difficulties flying a kite, the weak baseball team he manages, and so on. All of this hard luck starts to get to Charlie Brown and he becomes depressed. Lucy doesn't help matters when she psychoanalyzes him. I put all of your faults on slides. I never felt so completely miserable. Wait until you get my bill. This continues until Linus suggests he enter the school spelling bee. Despite the torment he receives at the hands of Patty, Violet, and Lucy, Fail your face! <laughs> he decides to go for it. By golly, I'll show him. But he blows it immediately. Well, in the original story from the comics, yes, but not here. Champion Charlie Brown, that has a lovely ring. A win for Charlie Brown. That's a genuine rarity in the Peanuts universe. With this victory behind him, Charlie Brown is pressured into entering the National Spelling Bee in New York City. And Linus gives him his blanket for good luck. Linus is a really good friend. The way he encourages Charlie Brown and then gives him his primary means of security. He's really showing his maturity and strength here. I made the mistake of giving my blanket to Charlie Brown. Now I keep fainting. Well, at least now Charlie Brown won't be alone in New York City. Of course, Charlie Brown has misplaced the blanket. So Linus and Snoopy have to look for it. As Linus trundles wearily through the streets of New York, Snoopy engages in some skating fantasies. One interesting aspect of this film is its visuals. Not just the animation, but the cinematography as well. Throughout the film, multiple scenes play on the screen simultaneously, capturing each character's reaction to a singular event. Some sequences, such as where Schroeder plays a Beethoven piece and Snoopy skates, contain real photographs and film sequences overlaying the animation. The artwork in this film, in addition to the story, is what makes this Peanuts movie favorable in my eyes. I suppose you could say that these moments are kind of just padding to lengthen the movie, but they are eye-catching and in some cases very sublime. The music is enjoyable as well, but with Vince Guaraldi helming most of the score, that's what I've come to expect. I think this might be my favorite of all the Peanuts films, just on the basis of visual presentation, as well as the story. Despite the continual losses Charlie Brown faces, he comes out of it stronger and wiser, he also keeps on going with Linus's encouragement. I suppose you feel you let everyone down, and you made a fool out of yourself and everything. But did you notice something, Charlie Brown? What's that? The world didn't come to an end. Like I said, this serves as a great introduction to Charlie Brown and the Peanuts universe. It certainly does a good job of making Charlie Brown relatable. All of us have likely been in situations like this. I guess what Rod McEwen sings to us at the beginning and end of the film holds true. We're all a 
cowboy named Charlie Brown. Snoopy Come Home. Oh boy, a film with Snoopy in the lead role. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Putting Snoopy in the lead role is not a surefire formula for a good product. In the animated world of Peanuts, Snoopy is the type of character that works best in small doses. He does well at providing relief from the main story. In the lead role, he can become overbearing. And I think this film shows that better than any other animated adaptation of Peanuts. This film shows Snoopy dealing with some of the hardships of being a dog. Mainly the No dogs allowed rule in many public areas. Yes, that is the guy who sang You're a Mean One, Mr. Grinch. This was the only Peanuts film made during Vince Guaraldi's life in which he had no involvement. Instead, the scoring went to the Sherman Brothers. These guys were responsible for the music you've likely heard in many old Disney films and on Disney theme park rides ad nauseum. Their score for the film is rather inconsistent. Sometimes the music is fitting and almost reminiscent of Garaldi's work. Other times it's a bit much. I'll get to some examples as we go along. So after Snoopy comes back late from a day at the beach with Peppermint Patty, Charlie Brown is not happy. It doesn't help that he also cut his thumb opening a can of Snoopy's food. After being thrown out of another place because of the No Dogs Allowed rule, Snoopy begins taking out his aggression on Lucy and Linus by fighting them both. Here's the most uncomfortable scene in the movie. Linus and Snoopy fighting over the blanket. Now, this is obviously nothing new in the world of Peanuts. In fact, the instances where Snoopy drags Linus around whilst he holds onto the blanket are among the funniest and most iconic sights in Peanuts media. However, what made those moments work were the cartoonish and over-the-top nature of the action, as well as the quick pacing. Here, the action is so sluggish, and hearing Linus's screams of agony just make this painful to sit through. Some of us have had the unfortunate experience of being kicked in the shin before and feel the pain when we see it happen to someone else. This is the kind of slapstick better suited to Tom and Jerry than to Charlie Brown and company. The stupid thing about this is that after Snoopy leaves and Charlie Brown, Lucy, Linus, and Peppermint Patty are pacing in a circle wondering why, Linus thinks it's because of this. You wanted my blanket. I wouldn't let go. You left. Because I was hostile and unkind to him. Well, he wasn't exactly asking nicely for it, Linus. Anyone would get mad in a situation like that. You shouldn't feel bad that Snoopy left. <laughs> Why did Snoopy leave? Oh, right, I should have mentioned that. So Snoopy receives a letter from someone named Lila, who we learn is in the hospital. Now as Linus finds out, Lila was Snoopy's original owner. She had to give him back to the Daisy Hill puppy farm after she found she could no longer keep him. How she found out that he lives with Charlie Brown, I have no idea. Anyway, Snoopy, along with Woodstock, making his debut appearance in a Peanuts film, make the long trek to see Lila, leaving Charlie Brown baffled and anxious. Along the way, they run into this girl. Do you guys know a character named Elmira Duff from Tiny Toon Adventures? That's pretty much this girl here. It wouldn't be surprising to me if they were somehow related. She traps Snoopy and Woodstock with her for what feels like an eternity while singing a song to them. I'm a sentimental gal. I need a fundamental power. Let's just say they convey her character a bit too well. Snoopy and Woodstock finally reach Lila and spend time with her, all while keeping out of sight of the hospital staff. You know, because... No dogs allowed. Now, Lila wants Snoopy to come home with her after she's out of the hospital. This is where Snoopy must make a difficult decision. 
He decides that Charlie Brown is the best person for him after all they've been through together. Now, that would make this film about 15 minutes too short. Instead, he goes back to Charlie Brown and tells him that he's leaving him for Lila. This results in a going-away party being thrown where gifts are distributed and many tears are shed. I get that it's meant to be sad, but it goes on for so long that it loses its emotional impact, and it continues after Snoopy leaves. Charlie Brown faces a long, lonely night alone while a pathetic song plays. This movie kinda goes overboard with its emotional scenes by dragging them on for so long. One of the Peanuts specials, Peace Your Dog, Charlie Brown, actually did a better job with a plot about Snoopy being gone. Yeah, Snoopy was a jerk here too, but I think it was better structured. Maybe being a 30 minute special helped it maintain more dignity. Just like in that special, Snoopy does go back to Charlie Brown in the end, but he winds up angering everyone when he demands they give him his things back. Isn't it great to have things back to normal? This was quite a heavy-handed film from an emotional perspective, and it shows how problematic Snoopy can be in a starring role. His arrogance, selfishness, and sometimes hostile nature are all showcased here to the detriment of his likability. While I am sympathetic to him being torn between moving in with Lila and staying with Charlie Brown, the slow pace of the emotional scenes and the flashy nature of the music make this a hard one to sit through. The film just overdoes things a bit, so it's not a favorite of mine. I certainly wouldn't put this among the worst Peanuts material I've ever seen. The film did have some moments in it here and there that I liked. It's just not thoroughly enjoyable enough to make me want to sit through it again. Okay, on to the next one. This film was probably the most requested as far as reviews go. I found multiple comments from people saying it was their favorite Peanuts film. I only recently went to watch it again after over two decades. On rewatch, Grace for Your Life, Charlie Brown did not strike me the way I expected. It was, well, all I can say is watch further and you'll see what I mean. Here, everyone's going to summer camp. This wasn't the first time Charlie Brown and company were in a setting like this, and it wouldn't be the last. However, this was the first time the gang faced off against a group of bullies. <laughs> and a cat. These guys, who are oddly never named, throw their collective weight around and make it plain that they're number one. The race in Race for Your Life, Charlie Brown, is a raft race filled with difficult obstacles along the way. The bullies make things worse for the others by cheating, which is how they won their previous victories. Are you not surprised? At just about every point along the way, these guys make it difficult for the others, whether it be by changing signs or just plain sabotage. It all makes for an action-packed race, and through it all, Charlie Brown must learn what it means to be a leader. Now, with what I just described to you, that sounds like a pretty exciting movie, doesn't it? Well, that was some of it. About halfway through the movie, a storm hits and Snoopy and Woodstock are separated. The race is then abandoned for about 20 minutes while the group tries to find them. Even the bullies get stranded. So, the action in this film is basically brought to a halt here as Snoopy tries to look for Woodstock and everyone else tries to look for Snoopy. Don't get me wrong, I do feel sorry for both Snoopy and Woodstock here. It's just that this is what kind of drags the film down. Several scenes are just pointless, or they play for way too long, like these scenes at the cabin in the woods. Once everyone reunites there, they have a bit of fun dancing and singing. Then, Peppermint Patty and the other girls vote to kick the boys out for the night. So the boys make a campfire outside and sleep, and then it starts snowing. I thought this was a summer camp. They're not only spreading the plot then, but the suspension of disbelief as well. Only after they begin talking about finding Christmas trees while eating dry cereal around the campfire does Charlie Brown remind everyone. We're supposed to be having a race! Have you forgotten that? I'd say they did. This entire section adds pretty much nothing to the film and could have been axed entirely. It really felt like it was just padding out the runtime. 
It takes the bullies throwing snowballs to remind everyone what the main plot of this movie is. Most of the action takes place within the last 15 minutes of the movie. This is where most of the noteworthy scenes take place. It's a mixture of rough water rafting, underhanded tactics, and a noticeably lax safety protocol. Who is running this camp? Chris McLean? It's up to Charlie Brown to get his group back on track to complete the race. And you know what? He does do a pretty good job leading. He shows a side to himself that's not the wishy-washy character that he's always made out to be. Of course, there's one hindrance that he has to deal with that's not the bullies. Peppermint Patty. She's probably the most obnoxious of the main cast here. More so than Lucy, actually. Half the time, she acts like she did in the Thanksgiving special where she was criticizing the meal Charlie Brown made for everyone. She also ends up costing Charlie Brown the race when she celebrates too early. Yeah, I know it's part of her character, but it gets really irritating. When you see a pair of Charlie Browns that's more irritating than Lucy, that's a problem. So, Charlie Brown and company don't complete the race, and neither do the bullies, as the Thorn of Karma punctures their raft and sinks it before the finish line. You can guess who wins here. No, just Woodstock. Hooray! This one was a bit of a mixed bag. I like that Charlie Brown's character grew a bit here, and there were several great action sequences. However, there was more than a bit of noticeable filler. I feel like this may have initially been intended to be a half-hour special, but was lengthened at some point into a feature film. Although I think it might have been better in a shortened form, this film still had quite a lot of memorable moments in it. The intense action scenes might be what gives the special a lot of favor in people's eyes. So for that, I'll put it right between Snoopy Come Home and A Boy Named Charlie Brown. Only two films left. Bon voyage, Charlie Brown. And don't come back! Now, among the Peanuts films there are, this was the one that I had the least memory of watching. I feel like I might have seen it once before, but very little was recognizable to me. It's not among the most memorable Peanuts films, but after watching it, I was satisfied with what I saw. It's quite a change of environment for Charlie Brown and company. This film takes some of the kids, as well as Snoopy and Woodstock, across the Atlantic. It's part of an exchange student program. Charlie Brown and Linus, as well as Peppermint Patty and Marcy, are chosen by their respective schools to head over to Europe as part of this program. Though how Peppermint Patty was chosen for this given her low grade point average is a mystery to me. Charlie Brown also gets a letter from someone named Violette en Fleur, inviting them to stay at the Chateau de Malvoisin. The Chateau of the Bad Neighbor, Chuck. You can probably tell there's going to be an element of drama in this, huh? The plane lands in England, and, well, it wouldn't be a proper Peanuts movie without some physical comedy. Whether it be Marcy and Peppermint Patty at the baggage claim, or Snoopy at Wimbledon. The physical comedy is in fine form throughout this movie, but there's more to see, especially considering that they're in Europe. There's a nice little montage that shows us several locations across the British countryside while the gang travels to Dover. I like the atmosphere and scenery of this movie. The novel designs of the towns and cities really heighten the visual presentation. It's also interesting to see the different modes of transport that the gang take to reach their destination. I didn't even know hovercrafts were in wide commercial use back in 1980. Finally, after renting a car, which Snoopy drives, it's time for each pair of kids to go to their respective host locations. The place where Peppermint Patty and Marcy stay is in a farm home with a boy named Pierre. Let the love triangle commence! Charlie Brown and Linus, meanwhile, make their way to the house of the bad neighbor and arrive there on a dark and stormy night. Did Snoopy write this movie? Nah, there aren't any French poodles in it, so he couldn't have. Of course, since it's the house of the bad neighbor, no one answers when they knock on the door. The house is owned by a baron, who is said to hate guests. Violette is his niece, who extended the invitation to Charlie Brown. Okay, this is one part of the film that doesn't make sense. If the baron doesn't like visitors, why doesn't he just throw Linus and Charlie Brown out after the first night? 
He seems to know they're there. Listen to him talking with the bartender here. They must be gotten rid of. <laughs> I, want, I didn't want strangers in the chateau. If they aren't out tomorrow, I will have to take some drastic steps. Violette later reveals to Linus that it was Charlie Brown's grandfather who helped her mother's family out during the Second World War. I feel like the Baron himself ought to have known this prior to Violette, and with that being the case, I should think it would have been a little easier to convince him to let Linus and Charlie Brown stay. Linus only finds this out when he sneaks into the house and finds Violette there. That's when the Baron comes home and... Oh look, the disastrous consequences of leaving a lit candle with a little kid. Linus calls out to Charlie Brown for help, and he quickly reacts... He quickly reacts and runs for the fire brigade. Or really, he runs to the tavern to get Snoopy and Woodstock, and then all the way to Pierre's house. And it's Pierre who has the sense to call the fire brigade. Well, Snoopy and Woodstock grab a fire hose from an old shed and set it up to help control the fire, so they're doing something useful. Now we get to see how Charlie Brown and his friends handle an emergency. Help! Help! Hey, Linus. You're holding on to something that's come in handy for you so often in previous years. Maybe you could use that to get yourself and Violette to a safer place. There you go. Use my blanket to catch us! Okay, now you're thinking. But after Violette jumps down, everyone just scatters and leaves Linus up on the window ledge for another minute. Yeah, Charlie Brown and Pierre start pumping the fire hose, but they could have done that after getting Linus down. Despite all their clumsiness, they do manage to get the fire hose working a few minutes before the fire brigade arrives. While I admire their heroism, I'd have to say their crisis control is only slightly better than that of the staff at Faulty Towers. <laughs> The next morning, it's revealed that the Baron has had a change of heart about guests, and Violette further explains the heroism of Charlie Brown's grandfather, as well as how she got in contact with Charlie Brown. So, everything ends happily enough for the game. Oh, and Charlie Brown has shown some affection and thanks. That's a nice change from his usual romantic pursuits. As for Peppermint Patty, who expects a kiss from Pierre... Well, it serves her right for saying this. Chuck, you have no romance. I actually think this movie was somewhat better than Race for Your Life, Charlie Brown. It didn't feel needlessly long, and the parts that didn't affect the plot much were at least amusing and entertaining. Everyone here was utilized effectively and felt in character, so I'd say this is a pretty good one. I'm going to put it behind a boy named Charlie Brown. I think that's a worthwhile spot for it. Well, only one Peanuts film remains, and it's very different from the other feature films. Can you see why? That's right. It's not a Mendelssohn Melendez production, and it wasn't written by Charles Schultz. Given that two of those three men had died prior to this film's production, it's no surprise things were handled by another studio altogether. Oh yeah, it's also 3D animated as well. That's probably the most notorious aspect of this movie. It's always a great risk rendering two-dimensional characters this way, as the results can wind up being very uncanny. Believe it or not, this actually wasn't the first three-dimensional glimpse we got of Charlie Brown and his friends. Figurines, Viewmaster cards, and the Snoopy Flying Ace game for the Xbox 360 have all done this prior to the Peanuts movie's release in 2015. Despite my reservations about seeing the Peanuts gang in 3D, I have to say the team at Blue Sky Studios didn't do a bad job rendering them. It takes a bit of getting used to, but there's nothing too jarring as far as visuals go, and the characters still retain some of the feel they had back in the early Peanuts specials. I know, animating Peanuts in 3D is far from necessary, but with it basically being a requirement for cinematic animation this day and age, it's probably the only way we'll get to see Charlie Brown and company on the big screen. What about the story, though? Well, 
A certain new kid arrives in the neighborhood, and Charlie Brown falls in love with her immediately when she shows up at his school. I think the identity of this new girl should be obvious if you know anything about Charlie Brown. The film showcases Charlie Brown's various attempts to impress the little red-haired girl, performing at the talent show, busting his moves at the school dance, and creating a thoroughly researched and comprehensive book report on War and Peace are all ways he tries to show how remarkable he is. If you expect his efforts to go 100% flawlessly, you clearly haven't been paying attention. Yep, fate has it out for Charlie Brown, and each time he thinks he's on top of his game, things all come crashing down. Sound familiar? B-E-A-G-E-L. Beagle. Ugh! 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 For longtime Peanuts fans, this story is nothing new. Specials and the comic strip have showcased all of this before. The very first movie, A Boy Named Charlie Brown, had a similar overarching plotline featuring Charlie Brown trying to overcome his reputation as a failure. Since this movie was made to showcase the Peanuts characters to a whole new generation, I guess it's only natural that it would cover much of the same ground as the specials and movies from the 1960s onward. To its credit, the Peanuts movie is probably the most fast-paced of the feature films. It never seems to drag too long in any one place, and everything is conveyed without going overboard on the drama or emotion or something like that. It does well at getting its point across without hammering things in. For younger kids, this may be the best and most accessible of the films for that reason. I think it's worth checking out for anyone who's a fan of Charlie Brown. Now, as far as where I'd put this movie in my rankings, I think the best place for it is right behind Race for Your Life, Charlie Brown, but only by a small margin. So there you have it, all five theatrical Peanuts films ranked in order of greatness, according to me at least. I'm not claiming to reflect universal consensus with the order of things here, so if you feel differently about any of these movies, that's fine. It's fascinating to see how Charlie Brown's character develops in each of these movies. That's one positive aspect to all of these. Charlie Brown's adventures teach him, and sometimes us by extension, how to deal with the problems that come our way in life. It's worth watching the Peanuts gang on screen for that, at least. If any future Peanuts releases are to come, I should hope they utilize Charlie Brown and his friends in a positive and meaningful aspect, and stay true to the spirit of the strip Charles M. Schultz brought us more than 70 years ago.